This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 22 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome everyone to another episode. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful but locked down upstate New York. Welcome, everyone. If you are new uh, to the podcast, I do hope you enjoy it, and I would love to hear your feedback. And uh, if you have been listening for a while, thank you as well for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to, to join us on the Homestead Journey. I would love to hear from you as well. Uh, you can reach me at the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com, and I really would love to hear how things are going with you on your homestead and any feedback that you have uh, with regards to the podcast. Um, first things first, I do want to give a shout out uh, and a huge thank you to Amy from A Farmish Kind of Life. If you are new to the podcast um, because of her, Thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much, for, uh, Amy, for um, the shout-out this week. Um, if you haven't checked out Amy's podcast, and I'm sure you probably have because her podcast is way better than mine, um, but uh, check it out at A Farmish Kind of Life. Uh, just a really, really great podcast coming from Minnesota. Um, she definitely has that Minnesota accent, and uh, but just a great podcast that I really, really enjoy. But she... um mentioned the Homestead Journey podcast uh, on her podcast this week, and uh, I just really, really appreciate it. I got to be honest, I I kind of um, fanboyed a little bit there um, when she mentioned it. I got a little giddy inside. And so anyhow, Amy, thank you so much um, for that. I I really do appreciate it and uh, just appreciate your kind words. It's been a wild, wild ride here on the homestead this week, and so let's jump right into this week's homestead happenings, and I will tell you all about it. It is really even tough to know where to start. Um, This week has been a bizarre week. It has been something straight out of, um, I don't know, a science fiction novel. And I'm not the only one. Obviously, it's not just uh, the homestead that's been impacted, but a lot of the decisions that are being made uh, by the, you know, by the, the federal and state governments have had direct impacts. I know not just on us, but on many people. But the fact that we do live in upstate New York, Um, has meant that uh, we have been dealing with some restrictions and changes to our lives that uh, other people in other places in the United States may not have been experiencing, at least not to the point that we have. Now, I know that schools across the United States pretty much are closed, um, and so that's not anything new for you, but uh, here in upstate New York, well, here in New York State, not just upstate New York, um, gradually throughout the week, they have been closing businesses, reducing workforces, um, and it has just been absolutely mind-blowing. So one of the biggest changes here on the homestead is that I have been working from home as of Wednesday, I think it was, or maybe it was Thursday that I started working from home Wednesday night. We actually spent the evening moving equipment around the house so that uh, I could set up in the office and my son could have a computer to do his schoolwork um, in his room. And uh, so it's just been very, very surreal. Uh, and, And that's because I work five miles from my house. So a... I know for some people, the, the the dream is to work from home. Honestly, that's not, not been my dream up to this point. I actually enjoy going to the office. I enjoy interacting with my peers. I, I, en- I, I like where I work. I, I'm not going to lie about that. I am not somebody who really has a dream of leaving the corporate life behind. Now, I mean, there are days when I do. 
Um, but I, I, I enjoy my job. I love where I work. I love the people that I work with. And uh, I enjoy going into work every day. And so it has been a, a bit bizarre um, working from home. And yet I, I'm not saying that I, I, don't, I, I don't, don't want you to think that I'm complaining because I'm not. I'm very, very thankful that I have a job where I can continue to work um, even if I am working remotely. But that has really messed with my head because one of the things I discovered last year when we did the emergency bathroom remodel is how much of a routine person I am. And when I get outside of my routine, it is very difficult for me to function. I don't know what day it is. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing next. And it has really just messed with my head. Uh, couple that with a, a few other things that we've had going on this week. And I did not get done anywhere near as much as I thought I was going to be able to get done because of this coronavirus situation. Um, I think I had shared with you last week that when I was out feeding the pigs last Sunday morning, I thought, well, my schedule is about ready to clear up. I'm going to be able to get all of this stuff done here on the homestead. Yeah, not quite so much. Now, I did get a few things done that I'll tell you about, and I've been sharing on our Instagram and our Facebook pages. If you haven't already checked those out, uh, we do have um, a presence on Instagram and on Facebook. Uh, just take a look for the Homestead Journey. And uh, so this week I've been sharing some pictures of some of the things that I, I had going on, but certainly did, got, did not get done anywhere near as much as what I had hoped. Um, this, the week started out with, um, us kind of scrambling, trying to get my mom and dad back from Brazil. And, uh, so that kind of, uh, weighed on my mind and took, uh, a bit of, uh, attention away from the homestead and not that I'm complaining again, I was very, very thankful that we were able to get them back safe and sound. And, uh, then again with the, the move here in in the house with swapping the office and, and just all of that kind of stuff. Again, that was another evening lost. I had a meeting at church uh, as we we're wrestling with how to handle things. That was another evening lost. And so it really wasn't until Friday evening that I really was able to get into some of the projects that I had hoped to do this week. And uh, so two of the big projects that I was able to accomplish this week Number one is I was able to get built Ohio brooders um, because we have chicks on the way. We have our lane, uh, our pullets that are supposed to arrive towards the end of this week and actually a few turkeys. And then the beginning of next week, our meat birds are supposed to get here. And if you've been following us along, you know that we built a mobile coop that we're going to be using as a brooder. Uh, as well. And so I wanted to build these Ohio brooders uh, to use instead of heat lamps. Now, I posted pictures of these in various stages of construction on Instagram. And I had people that were, and I think on Facebook as well, shared them to some of the homesteading groups. And people were really confused because the name Ohio brooder, they think that that is the brooder. And that's not really what it is. It's, it's a box that has lights in it that goes inside your brooder. And in essence, what it's mimicking is a hen, right? So it's a box with kind of a cover on it. The lights are inside it. And what that does, what does heat do, right? Heat rises. What that does is it keeps the heat from es escaping, um, which is what happens with a heat lamp inside a traditional brooder. That heat's going to rise and it can be cold on the floor where the chicks are. In the past, I've used heat lamps in our brooder in our garage and that wasn't necessarily a heated um, or climate controlled environment, but being out in a mobile coop that's raised up off the ground, I was really concerned about whether or not we would be able to keep the coop and thus the brooders warm enough. And so I saw this design and again, you can see the pictures of it on our um, Instagram page and our Facebook page. I'll also provide a link in the show notes to some more information about the Ohio style brooder. If that's something that you're interested 
and build in yourself. But I built two of them. They're two by two in size, which should be uh, the right size for about 50 chicks. And uh, what we have coming is we have about 45, I think, pullets that are supposed to be coming while well, pullet chicks. And then we have um, 30 uh, meat birds and then seven turkeys that I'll keep with the meat birds for a little bit. So we'll see how all of that goes, but I'm very excited about that. And I was able to get those um, put together uh, yesterday, well, Friday night yesterday, and then I finished them up today. And they're totally built out of scrap. The only thing that I bought was I bought some of the hardware, um, you know, like the boxes, the, the light fixtures, obviously the lights. But everything else is all out of scrap lumber, scrap siding that I had around um, some scrap beadboard from the bathroom remodel. Uh, so I was able to really repurpose and reuse a lot of stuff that we had laying around the homestead. And so I was very happy with that. The other major project that I, I took on this week is I needed to build a feed storage box um, because we have been having a lot of problems with mice this winter. This was the first time I kept chicken feed in our garage in a quantity during the winter uh, during a winter and uh, it, it just did not work out well um, and so we have been struggling with mice because of that feed and what I did is I just kept it on a pallet in the garage not a good idea at all and so this uh, weekend what I did is I I moved all the feed off I cleared out underneath the pallet and then again, using scraps that we had laying around, scrap siding left over from the mobile coop, um, scrap two by fours that I had left over from the coop, um, and then some more beadboard that I use as the cover, I have built a feed storage bin. It's not totally done. I need to get a couple of hinges for it, but uh, pretty close to being done. And then hopefully that will help us um, eradicate this these mice because we've been feeding them for free. And so we'll be able to keep our chicken feed, our rabbit feed in that, in that box. And uh, it should hopefully keep the rodents out. That's my, my goal. That's my plan. Now, if you have a great feed storage um, method that uh, you can share with me, again, let me know that. Contact me on Instagram, Facebook, send me an email. Um, I'd love to know how you deal with it if you keep feed in bulk. But... You know, up to this point, feed has been relatively easy for me to get. It's relatively plentiful. And uh, so I haven't worried about feeding a few mice as much as I probably should have. But now feed is becoming, you know, potentially. I'm not saying that it is an issue, but potentially it could be an issue. It may be something that I may not be able to source. And because of all of the uncertainty, you know, you, I have to think about every dollar that I spend on the homestead, how it's being it's being spent. I don't want to waste it on feeding mice. And so that's what I'm working on or that's what I worked on this week. Um, one other thing that we had happen this week is, and of all the weeks, you know, here it is. We're, we're trying to work on being prepared. We're trying to think about, okay, our food systems and all of those kinds of things. And I think it was Friday. I was in the middle of working and my son all of a sudden just goes hollering down the hallway and out the door. And we had um, some hawks. I think it was three hawks get into our chicken run and take out a couple of our hens. Um, that is something that I have never had happen. We have had chickens in that run, uh, in that coop, and I keep them in a run because I know that we have predator issues, and particularly hawks. My neighbor has lost some chickens to hawks, and uh, yet they took out a couple of our hens. So right now we have the hens confined to the coop and the mobile run or the covered run, the hoop house. And then we are going to work on putting up some netting over the uh, run to, to hopefully deal with these hawks. But if all the time for us to get hit by a hawk, it was this week. So that's what's been going on here on 3B Farm and Homestead. Again, not as much done as I would have liked or that I had, I had thought I would get done this week. But um, it is what it is. 
And uh, this coming week is a new week, and we'll see what we can get done. All right, let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. Now, last week we spent some time talking about homesteaders as preppers, something I had never really considered myself to be, and yet in light of well, some of the things that I've been listening to and some of the things that have been going on and kind of our approach to dealing with all of this coronavirus stuff, I've really come to understand that, well, I think that homesteaders, generally speaking, are preppers. We are a little bit better prepared, generally speaking, than the average individual. And I don't say that boastfully, but it's just the reality of what we do. And it's been funny as I have talked to people throughout the last couple of weeks and people have been, you know, going on their shopping sprees and and so forth. I've had many people say to me, well, you should be pretty well set there on the homestead. And quite frankly, they're right. We are pretty well set here on the homestead. And again, that's not being boastful. That's just simply the reality of how we live our lives. And it's just a benefit of the homesteading lifestyle. But having said that, we certainly are not perfect. And that's to be expected. This is a journey. It's a journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. And none of us are as far down the road as we would like to be. That's, again, just the reality of things. Depending on when you started this journey, you may be farther ahead. You may be a little bit farther behind me. And really, folks, it, this isn't a race, you know, to say that you're farther ahead or I'm farther ahead or whatever. That's probably, I, I probably shouldn't refer to it as such because, again, this isn't a race. And your goals on your homestead are going to be different than my goals on my homestead. And so perhaps to, to compare them is unfair to both of us. Um, but now, many of us are facing, I wouldn't necessarily call it a crisis at this point, but many of us are looking forward uh, to a lot of uncertainty. There is just a lot of uncertainty right now because of the things that are going on in our world with regards to coronavirus. And so, I'll be honest with you, this is probably not the best time to focus on a homestead preparedness series. Unfortunately, whether it's a whether it's coronavirus or it's the loss of a job or it's the loss of our health or the loss of a of, of a loved one or it's a natural disaster, many times we find ourselves woefully unprepared to confront the situations that we're dealing with. You know, the old adage is failing to plan is planning to fail. And, and I think there's certainly some truth to that. And, and I, I'm not saying that to beat me up or to beat you up, because I think many of us have have been doing our best to, to prepare, although we maybe didn't think of it in those terms, but we have been on this journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. But now we find ourselves, to a certain extent, facing a crisis, and we're not as far down the road as we wished we were. Yes, obviously the best time to prepare for a crisis is in the good times. And so my hope is that Somebody five years from now runs across this podcast, maybe 10 years from now, they run across this podcast and uh, they're listening to this. And if you are in that, in that situation, it's 2025 or 2030 and you're listening to this podcast, my hope is, is at that point, things have bounced back to normal and I'm using huge air quotes. I'm not sure what normal is, but my hope is that times are good. And to you, I am saying the best time to prepare is when times are good. But that's not where we're at right now. And so today I want to talk a little bit about preparing in times of uncertainty. Preparing, how do you prepare in times of crisis. It's not the optimal time to do this, 
when entering a crisis or in the middle of a crisis, that's not the optimal time to consider homestead preparedness, but I don't think it's too late to think about it. In fact, as I've thought about this coronavirus thing, and I've thought about, at least for those of us here in the U.S., this is really hitting us at the best possible time of the year that this could happen. Now, certainly I would rather not deal with this at all, but if I were to pick a time of the year to confront a crisis like this, this is the time of the year I would want to do it. I mean, our gardening season is getting underway. Um, and so for most of us, it's not too late to think about planning and, and planting and a garden and harvesting and all of those kinds of things. This is the time of the year when people, generally speaking, are thinking about buying chicks and raising meat chickens and maybe getting quail or getting other animals on their homestead. Um, this is the time of the year when people are thinking about getting bees. This is the time of year when th people are thinking about getting perennials and fruit trees and all of those kinds of things. So this is definitely, if I were to pick a time of the year, a season in which I would want to confront something like this, this is definitely the time of the year that I, 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 would, I would pick. I mean, if this were happening in July, at that point, it's too late to put in more tomatoes. Uh, it's too late to, you know, th there's a lot of things that it's too late to do at that point. But now we can think about, okay, I'm going to plant extra tomatoes. I'm going to plant extra beans. I'm going to plant extra peas. I'm going to freeze more, can more, dehydrate more. I'm going to ferment more. There's a lot of things that we can do, and there's going to be food coming on that we're going to be able to eat fresh so that in case things all fall apart and there's food shortages and so on and so forth, we'll still be able to survive. And so, no, I don't think it's too late to think about preparedness. Is it the optimal time? No. But at least we're in a good spot, in the U.S. at least, from the time of the year. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I almost didn't do a podcast today because, quite frankly, this week I have felt very, very overwhelmed. Uh, I have felt very overwhelmed, folks. And, and some of it is because, again, I'm a, as I said, I'm a routine person, and when I get out of my routine, it just messes with my head. Um, but I've also been doing a lot of thinking. You know, it's one thing to grow food when you know if this crop fails, it's no big deal. I can go down to the grocery store. I can go down to the farmer's market. I can do this. I can do that, and I'll be okay. I've got a backup plan. I don't know, folks, if I'm going to have a backup plan to what I plant this year. And 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 I and maybe I'm just way overthinking this and I'm not trying to terrorize you, but these are some of the things that I've just been chewing on this week as I've been thinking this is for real. And so the decisions that I am making with regards to our homestead right now really are weighing heavily on me. But as I thought about that, I thought, you know Brian, if you feel overwhelmed by this, there are people, and again, I'm not I'm not saying that I'm better or I'm smarter or anything, but there are people that are much newer to this than you are. Maybe they're brand new to this. Imagine how overwhelmed they're feeling. I can only imagine how overwhelmed some people, a person who has never planted a garden before, a person who has never raised an animal for meat before, um, a, a person who has never, ever thought about providing for their own welfare. I can't imagine how overwhelmed they're feeling right now. And so my goal today is to give you some hope, to give you some direction, to help you, because again, it's not too late to start thinking about some of these things and maybe taking small steps. They may be baby steps, but they may end up being huge baby steps. Who knows? I don't know what's going to happen. And I'm not trying to milk this and blow it. I don't know, folks. I, there's so much about this that I just have not been able to wrap my head around. But I do know this. Every little step that you take can end up having a huge payback in the future. In fact, uh, I got an email from, from Clyde from Clyde's Garden Planner today, and he said one pack 
of tomato seeds. A $3.50 pack of tomato seeds can generate over 350 pounds of tomatoes. So little things can have a huge payback for you. You know, I get folks that not everybody's going to have room to generate the 350 pounds of tomatoes. I get that you're not going to only want to eat tomatoes. I get that. But my point is that the little things can end up having a huge payback. And so it certainly is not too late to start thinking about being prepared on your homestead. Even though it's not most optimal time, it's certainly not too late. Now, the temptation for us, really at any stage of our homesteading journey, but especially now when we're facing moments of, um, of uncertainty, is to try to do all of the things. And folks, that is just a recipe for disaster. Now, we may need to add a few more things to our homestead than we had originally planned, but you're not going to be able to go from not prepared to fully prepared overnight. It just doesn't happen like that. And you are end, you're going to end up either burning out or not being successful because you tried to do all of the things all at once. And so if you're brand new to this or if you've been doing it for a while, just keep that in mind. You're not going to be able to do all of the things. So this is what I have been doing this week, or I at least have been attempting to do this week as I have faced these feelings of being overwhelmed preparing during a time of crisis. And it really comes down to focus. First of all, I'm trying to focus on what is in my control. There are certain decisions that are going on, whether it's decisions with work or decisions made at the state level or at the federal level that are kind of all trickling down. Um, there are certain things that are outside of my control. Am I going to get sick? Or one loved ones that I, you know, I care so deeply about, are they going to get sick? There's just a lot of things that are outside the bounds of my control. And if I focus and dwell on those things, that is going to be time, effort, and energy that I have spent on things that I can't do a darn thing about. <laughs> and all it does is it drags you down. Now, folks, I'm not suggesting that we go stick our heads in the sand. But if we are trying to prepare during a time of crisis, we need to focus on the things that are in our control and not worry as much about the things that we can do nothing about. The second thing is, is that I am trying to focus on what we need. Now, when I talk about that, what we need, I'm talking about really very, very basic things. Now, I'm going to just take a moment here, folks. People listen to this podcast around the world. It's amazing to me, and I appreciate everybody that takes time out of their day to listen to this podcast. People are literally listening from around the globe. There's places that just blows my mind that people are listening to this podcast. But the majority of the people that are listening to this podcast are Americans. And so I'm going for a moment, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to speak as an American to Americans. Folks, we have such a high standard of living that we have lost sight of what true needs really are. We live so well that we think that we need a cup of coffee from Starbucks or that we need a cell phone or that we need internet access. Now, all of those things are nice, and I understand the importance of some of those things within our society, but we don't need those things. Really, when it comes down to it, there are four basic needs, right? The four basic needs are food, water, shelter, clothing. Those are the four basic needs. Anything above and beyond that is gravy. 
But we as Americans have lost sight of that. And so what I have tried to do, and, and, and when I say we, I'm saying we. I like I, I'm putting myself in that boat. Now, I was very blessed. Some of you may not know this. My mom and dad were missionaries for almost 20 years to Brazil. And I, I spent my teenage years in Brazil. I love the country. Um, I miss it. I sometimes get very, very homesick for it. But anyhow, I digress. Um, but my point is, is that I have seen extreme poverty. I have seen people who did not have anything. And even still, sometimes I admit I take things for granted. And I think I need certain things. And I forget. And, and folks, if we can afford them and times are good, I'm not necessarily saying that's wrong. But when we're faced potentially with the crisis that we're facing, at that point in time, we need to really stop and think about what we need. Food, shelter, water, clothing. And how are we going to prepare, how are we going to provide for those things on our homestead. And so this week, as we, my wife and I have had certain conversations, we have started making tough decisions with regards to how we are going to spend our money. If our the money that we are spending doesn't contribute directly to those basic needs, we're thinking twice about it. You know, I had thought, about I had planned, I had shared that with you, I believe, on the podcast, that one of my ideas or one of the things I wanted to do this year was to bring in some rock and to, um, to, to fix our driveway. We have some potholes in our driveway. We can go with potholes in our driveway. It's a pain in the butt. I may be able to s- scrape some things down with the tractor, but it's not the end of the world. We're not going to die if we have potholes in our driveway. Right, so I'm I'm really thinking seriously about how I'm spending my money and how it contributes to providing food, water, shelter, clothing. You know, this week I spent time on building those brooders because raising those chicks is going to contribute to us being able to have food. I spent time on that feed bin because A, I don't want to have the mice running around. (laughs) B, I don't want the mice to be stealing the food because that food is going to help me raise animals which will contribute to our basic need of food. And so you need to focus on what you need. And we're going to talk more next week in depth about how raising food on your homestead, in my opinion, is the best way for you to be prepared on your homestead. The best way that you can you know, take care of yourself is to raise and grow your own food. Um, we're going to talk about that more in depth next week, but focus on what you need. And the third thing is kind of, it kind of goes with that a little bit, but that is to focus on becoming a producer instead of a consumer. And I, I, and I kind of touched on this a little bit last week, but some people's idea of preparedness is to go down to the store and to buy all of the things and to store them in their basement. And there are certain things that we're not, potentially not going to be able to produce on our homestead the scale that we may need them. For example, where I live, the amount of land I have, I'm probably not going to be able to produce enough wheat to make flour, right? There are just certain things that we're not going to necessarily be able to produce enough of. Um, Where I live at, there are certain things that don't grow and I may need those things. You know, I'm not going to be able to provide my own salt, for example. Obviously, you don't grow salt, but there's not a salt mine here. Um, There's not any salt water where I could go dry it out, so I'm not going to be able to provide myself with salt. But the best that I can do, to the best of my ability, we need to focus on becoming producers instead of consumers. And so maybe in the short term, you've got to do what you've got to do in order to be able to um, provide for your family. And so maybe you've got to buy 
uh, long-term storage foods and so forth, but focus on becoming a producer instead of a consumer. And you can do that in such simple ways. And again, we'll talk about some of that next week as we think about raising and growing our own food and raising animals and so on and so forth and how that is a huge step that we can take even in the times of crisis, even at a less than optimal time, we can think of, I've got friends that are getting quail. Got another guy that I was talking to today that he's looking into getting rabbits because those are things that can quickly produce meat. There's a quick turnaround on that. And so that, you know, your, your diet may end up being very monotonous if all you're doing is eating rabbit or all you're doing is eating quail, but you're going to survive. And so in moments of crisis, again, thinking about what you need, getting beyond your wants, and thinking about becoming a producer instead of a consumer. All right, folks, thanks again for tuning in to another episode of the Homestead Journey podcast. I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, Quite honestly, this has been a very difficult podcast for me to put together simply because I have felt very, very overwhelmed and discombobulated (laughs) this week. And uh, so I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear from you with regards to how you are um, approaching preparedness at this time. Um, Do you feel overwhelmed? Don't you feel overwhelmed? Am I the only one that uh, that feels this way? I I certainly don't think I am, but uh, I'd love to hear from you. And uh, if you have found this helpful, I'd love to hear that. If it's been something that you haven't enjoyed, I'd like to hear that as well. My goal is to try to help as many people uh, as possible on this journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. As always, the music on this episode is provided by Audionautics.com, so thank you very much to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.